Welcome back. So in the last video, we talked a lot about the theory and differences between relational databases and NoSQL databases. In this lecture, we'll go over how to start using your MongoDB database with your Node.js web applications. So first, let's talk about how you connect to the database. Um, the first thing you'll need to get started is to install the MongoDB driver for node. And that's as simple as, as running the command npm install mongodb. Um, by the way, the these instructions to get started, uh, you can find a lot of this information over at the node driver quick start. That's where I pulled a lot of this. Do note the code samples that they provide there are a little bit different um, than the ones that I'm going to give you. Um, so when in doubt, go off the ones in these slides instead of the ones in the quick start. So let's go over a, a code example first. Pieces together of, of your basic process of, of what has to be there in order for you to do anything with the database. And, and specifically, this is concerned with um, getting data out of the database. In order to bring in data, and my goal here is to find a product by name. I need to first bring in that MongoDB module, which we just installed. Um, so we're going to require that. And then you'll notice on the left, I'm doing something a little bit different. Um, so normally I would just say const MongoDB equals require MongoDB. And if I do that, I'm bringing in the entire module. In this context, I actually don't need the entire module. And in fact, I only want one part of the module. Um, so I only want one class from there, which is Mongo client. Um, and I also don't want to have to say anytime I use Mongo client, I don't want to have to say MongoDB dot Mongo client. Um, so by doing this, it simplifies that syntax. So I can just say Mongo client. Um, but it also means that I don't necessarily need to have all the other things in my namespace. What I'm doing there is something called destructuring. Um, so destructuring involves taking the object and picking off just the pieces that you want. Um, so this is basically, I grab the whole MongoDB module, but only pick off the Mongo client class from there. That's the objective and that's what's happening. Um, so we, if we wanted additional pieces there, we could put commas in there and, and pull in um, other parts of that. Um, in the end, we only need two parts from MongoDB module uh, Mongo client is one and we'll see one more on a later slide. So I'm going to find a run method, which is where I'm going to put my test code. Um, so this is the, this is the entire application here um, is run. And then we're going to call run down here. So we define this run method and then we call it down here. Um, the reason I need to create that method is I need to create an asynchronous context so that I can use the await keyword within it. Let's create that method. Inside there, I'm gonna have my classic try and catch. Um, I'm having that catch there to say, well, things could go wrong with the database, connecting to it could fail. Um, so if, if anything goes wrong, we'll go ahead and log that error. All right, so let's start looking at what's inside the try block. First thing I'm doing is I'm, I'm creating some constants for um, the URL to the database as well as the database name. Both of those are pieces that you have to have in order to actually connect to the database. Um, you need a URL for it as well as the name of the database. Um, the, now the name of your database will be just whatever you make it. Um, the DB URL, if you're working locally, it'll always be this MongoDB localhost port 27017, because that's the default port um, for Mongo. Um, so if you're working with a local server, that's what it's gonna be. If you're connecting to another cluster, say a, an Atlas cluster, then you'll have a different URL there, um, which you'll get from that from the, the, the Mongo Atlas interface, uh, web interface. Once we've got those two pieces of information, then we can start actually working with the code. So I'm gonna create a client object um, and the way I'm going to do that, I'm going to say mongo client dot connect. So mongo client connect initiates the connection process using the URL that we have and, and trying to connect to the database. Um, that returns a promise for a client uh, because it does take some time for the connection to actually go through. Um, so that's where we're awaiting this because that is a promise. So we're going to wait that so that we have the Mongo client that we can use in the next step. 
Um, and then we're going to say client.db, pass in that database name. So here it's my project. Um, and then finally save that to our database variable here. So we first get the, the client connected and then we connect to the, we switch to the actual database that we're concerned with. Um, it's worth noting that you won't get any errors with MongoDB for a database that doesn't exist. Um, if the database doesn't exist, it will simply need, it will simply create it as soon as you start putting things, putting data into it. Um, so do make sure that you have that database name correct, um, as it won't give you a warning or an error otherwise. Um, which, on the one hand, is good um, because it means that your your application can start up really quickly with no no setup um, just a blank database can be created as needed um, but it does mean that you know typos are a little bit more uh, a little bit harder to catch um, with your database name so next thing up once we've created the database we need to then step down to the next level in there which is the collection um, which is kind of like a table if you remember from last week um, so I'm going to say database.collection and then I need to provide the collection name. So in here I'm saying I'm going to ask for the products collection. Okay, so that's going to give me back the, the products collection. I'm going to save that to another variable. And then from there I want to get a product out of that collection. So to get a project out of that collection I'm going to use the find one method. So find one just returns the first um, the first document from a collection that matches a particular um, set of criteria. Um, so in here I'm, I'm defining the criteria with with this query object this um, where I'm saying I want the first object where the name is red boots. So that's kind of a, a very simply defined query. You can kind of think about it as the uh, as your your where clause in a select statement. Um, so I'm saying give me the the product where the name is red boots um, that then returns a promise for the actual document so again I need to wait um, so these are the two places where you have to remember to wait when you're doing the connection with Mongo client and when you do the actual database operation those two parts um, are where you're gonna see the await um, and then finally I log the result the product that I got from the database out to the console so we can see it. Um, so that's the basic steps that you, you're going to see in, in most trips to the database. Um, now the reality is, is most of the time these first few lines from you know line 5 down to line 8 or so, um, those are pretty standard um, as far as opening up the database. So we could probably take those and split those up and, and, and split those into two separate functions where, where this part is something that we can reuse. And this is then something that we have to, this is something that we do, you know, we tack on that part based on what kind of operation we want to do with the database. So, you know, which, which table we need to work with, which collection we need to work with changes, as well as how we want to, what we want to do with that collection. Um, so we can break those up into two modules with two two different functions, as which is what we'll what we'll do to try and increase the code reuse. Um, but there's a little bit to that that we want to go over um, in a minute. Um, so before we talk about how to break that up and, and make that more generic, um, let's talk quickly about the connection URI or the connection URL that you're seeing there. Um, you saw that the, the very simple one there was MongoDB, localhost, um, and then the port number. Uh, but they can actually be a little bit more to it. So the in general, the connection URI or the connection URL, um, you'll hear to it referred as both. It, it doesn't really matter um, which you say. But the connection URI is a set of instructions that the driver uses to connect to a MongoDB deployment. Um, and it instructs the driver how it should connect to MongoDB and how it should behave while connected. Um, so the following example shows part of the connection URI, uh, shows each part of the connection URI. So we'll talk about a little bit of what each of those parts mean. And, and you'll notice that some of those, those parts we didn't see in the previous example because they're, they're optional. So the first part you're gonna see is the 
protocol. Just like in any normal URI, that's the first part. You should specify the protocol. The protocol is going to be one of two things. It's going to either be MongoDB or MongoDB plus SRV. Um, if it's MongoDB, then it's just the standard connection format. That's the one you're going to see most of the time. Um, the other one, MongoDB plus SRV, is the DNS seedless connection format. Um, that one's definitely more advanced than what we want to talk about here. Um, so if you want to know how that works, just, just follow the link there, and, and you'll see some more about you know, what that is and why you might want it. Um, but we're, we're just going to be using MongoDB um, for this example here. Um, the next part is the credentials, specifically the username and the password. Um, so if you're getting this um, from, say, a Mongo Atlas cluster, um, or you're hosting it somewhere else on another machine, you'll definitely need to have a username and a password there to specify how to connect to it. Um, but if you're using it locally, um, by default locally, you don't have to supply a username and password if you're connecting just to your local server. Um, so that's that's why it's not there in the, the previous example, because it's optional when you're doing mm -hmm. locally. So let's say we're, we get, a, get this database set up on an Atlas cluster. Um, we'll have the username colon password there. Um, those, as we kind of talked about last week, you need to go through the... Um, through the UI in Atlas to create that account. Um, so you'll pick the username and the password, um, and then that's what you need to fill in there in order to be, um, be able to connect. Uh, but you'll notice they're part of the URL, whereas when you're doing things, remember with MySQL, they're kind of separate pieces of data stored separately from some of the other things. Uh, with, with MongoDB and these URLs, they pack a lot of those things that we had separate fields, all into this one uh, URI. So keep that in mind. That means that the URI is oftentimes something that you need to keep safe because it does contain that password. Um, so next up, so so in there we just say, well, you replace user and pass, you know, with the part that you need and. Um, some authentication me mechanisms don't necessarily require the username and password to be in there. So um, those are optional. The next part you see is the host name and the instance. Um, that can be either host name or an IP address. Either one can be there. Um, and then the, the part after that is what you call the, is the port. Um, so right now that example and the previous example are just using the default port, um, but that can be changed. Um, the final part is the um, some additional options or parameters that you might want to pass in um, to control how the the config to configure how the connection is set up. Um, so, for instance, you can see that there's a pool size that's been set to 20, and there's this W parameter, which is how things are are writ has to do with how things are written. Um, and, and the number of servers that you have to wait for agreement, um, that's set to majority. Uh, we're not really going to talk about all of those options. There's quite a few, um, but they're, they're pretty far in the weeds for what we're going to do this semester. Um, so you can look at the connection options and, and find out how some of those work. Um, but other than pool size, we're not really going to talk about any of those this semester. So let's start getting our, our code set up and, and working to, to use MongoDB in our actual applications. Um, so the first thing you want to do is, is update the config, because um, obviously we don't really want to embed our URL or our name directly in our code. We'd rather have those extracted into the config where we can um, have them kind of in one place, easy to change, but also um, also configurable via environment variables. So in custom environment variables.json, we need to change how the DB section is. Um, if you look at how it was previously with MySQL, you saw that there were quite a few different pieces there that we had to set. Um, you know, we had to set the um, host name, we had to set the port, we had to set the username and the password, and those were four different parameters. Um, but with the way things are with, with MongoDB, those are all together in the URL. 
Um, so, so that's going to reduce the number of, of environment variables and, and such that we have configuration options. So the URL, um, I'm just going to point that at to the environment variable db underscore URL. The name of the database, I'm going to pull that from db underscore name. And the pool size, I'm going to pull that from db underscore pool. Um, so those are the three parameters that I want to, to be able to be configured from the environment variables. Uh, next up in default.json we need to set some defaults for those values. Um, so the default URL I'm just going to set to localhost 27017 so by default it connects just to the local server um, that you might have running. I'm going to set my name to, to my project. Obviously change that to the appropriate project name for, for what you're working with. Um, so that'll be your database name. Finally, we have the pool size. We're going to default to five. Um, so the pool size, by the way, um, that configures how many connections that it will try to keep open. Um, so for for instance, here we're saying by default, you want to try and keep five connections open to the database um, and then reuse those connections. Uh, it's kind of an important parameter to tweak. Um, basically, the more uh, users you have active, the the higher the higher you probably want that pool. Um, but it also kind of depends on how many servers are actually running your application. Um, so it, let's say you have you know a uh, hundred customers on at the same time, and you're running on twenty different servers. Well, well, five connections open is is still pretty good number. Um, so, so you know that's that's kind of one you tweak. If you have more activity, you may need to put it up. But then, as you also as you add more servers into the mix, you can actually also push push that down. So there's kind of a happy medium of of trying to you know configure that and figure out what works for you. Um, it's probably gonna find you're probably gonna find that the 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 right place for that to be is really five to ten. Um, if you get to a point where you maybe need more than ten, you might need more than one server as well running the application. So let's talk about how we build the, the database module from there. We've we figured out the configuration part. Um, let's actually start laying the groundwork for our database module. Um, so to start building that out, we need a few dependencies we're going to bring in. Uh, we need a debug as, as normal. Um, so I'm going to require the debug module and then uh, set my channel to app colon db so that anything that's logged goes to that channel for the database. We need to bring in the config module, which we'll need to bring in the configuration options that we just set up. And then I also want to bring in MongoDB. Uh, now this time I'm actually bringing in two pieces. Um, I'm bringing in the Mongo client that we had earlier, but I'm also bringing in object ID. Um, and object ID will let us deal with, with object IDs in a moment. We'll use that for a number of things, um, but we'll come back to that. So next thing I want to do is write a method that I can use to connect to the database. Okay. Um, that needs to be an async method, so I can use the await keyword inside of there. I won't put any sort of try catch in here because I want the methods that call this to deal with any exceptions. Um, this method by itself doesn't really know how to deal with those, and, and there's no way for it to really have that ability um, because it's at such a low level. So whoever's calling this needs to needs to deal with the, any exceptions that could could occur. Um, so first things first, we want to get those configuration parameters that we just set uh, set up using uh, config.get. So I'm going to say let's get the URL, um, the name of the database, as well as the pool size. We'll get all three of those things from the DB section of that config. Um, save those to local variables so I can use those in a moment. And then I need to say mongo client dot connect. Okay, so Mongo client connect is going to give us that, open up that client. Remember, it does return a promise, so we need to await it. Um, the first parameter to connect is that URL, so I'm just going to pass in that configuration parameter that we had. The next parameter to connect is a, an object of options. Um, so there, there are a bunch of optional settings that you can add. Um, we're going to only add two. Specifically, we're going to add use unified topology and set that to true. Um, the reason that we're adding that is because if you don't, you do get a, 
um, a deprecation warning in your console that you need to set it to true. Um, and, and it basically comes down that they've changed some, some ways of, of how things have kind of worked underneath the scene where um, there was different code design for different types of network setups, different types of server setups. Um, so like if you had a single server, it was a little bit different underneath there. Or if you had a um, cluster of three servers, or if you had multiple clusters, you might need to change um, how you connect. Um, but that all happens automatically now, as long as you set use unified top topology to true. So that's why they're asking you to do that. Um, so that's that's basically something we just in the end it, it really is just something we set to true and then we forget about it because it just automatically does what we want, um, and and that's part of why the I think the deprecation is there. It's like well you really should turn this on. Um, so next option we're going to set is the pool size. Remember we pulled that from uh, the config, um, and that by default is five. That's just to say how many connections, right? Remember, that's just to say how many connections we want to keep open. Um, so those are the two things we're providing as options. There are a bunch more options available. You can look at the documentation and see those. Um, but that's that's all we'll really need for the for what we're doing in this course um, is those two. The next thing we want to do is is open up or select the database that we're working with. So I'm going to say um, client.db, pass in the database name, and then finally now I have that database, I can return it. Um, so that means that first part of the, the first example, this kind of collapses that all into one function, so I can reuse this connect function um, anytime I need to do something with the database. I don't need to repeat all that code every time I want to connect to the database, which is great. Um, so that drastically improves our, our code reuse. Uh, the problem with this approach is that it's not very efficient. Um, and it's, it's so inefficient that you should really never use this approach. Um, the problem is that every time we call connect, it creates a new client. Um, and connects the database all over again. Um, so even though we have this pool, it's creating a new pool every time we call connect. So we're not really getting the benefits of the pool. Um, so in order to really make this work efficiently, we need to make sure that we save the client and reuse it on, on later, um, later calls to the database. So the way I'm going to implement that is I'm going to use something called a singleton pattern. Um, so with a singleton pattern, the idea is that you only want that you only want to have one instance of a thing, um, and and the way I'm the way I'm managing that is I'm taking the the database connection, and I'm saving it to a global variable. So I'm saving it to this global variable called underscore database. Um, the reason I put an underscore in that name is to kind of give some indication that it's a private variable and that you should not really be using it in the rest of your code. Um, so while it is there, none of the rest of the code should know about or touch it. The only method that should touch the, the underscore database variable is the connect method itself. Um, so that's why I'm calling it underscore database, not just database or not just DB. Um, that's what the underscore is about. Um, so please, please, please make sure you include that. Um, next thing I want to do is I'm going to define my connect method, but I'm going to change it a little bit. So I'm going to add in there. The first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to check if there is a connection that has been previously opened. So I'm going to say if there's not, if there, if there isn't a connection that hasn't been previously opened, if not database, which initially is true, um, then we'll go in here and we'll, we'll open up that connection and then finally save it to underscore database. Um, otherwise, and, and from there on out, assuming the connection is now open, um, we'll just go directly and remove, return the database. Um, so the first time through, this will go through all the connection logic, but any time from there on out, it doesn't have to do anything. It just says return database. Um, so this is the method anytime we need to connect to a database, you want to make sure you use connect. 
um, don't use the da underscore database variable directly because it may or may not still be null. Um, so make sure you're using connect. There on. But that that bundles the the logic together. That ensures we're not creating multiple pools and multiple connections, um, that multiple clients. So that way that way you the rest of your code will be efficient. Okay. Now that we've done that, let's talk about the database. Go down a little bit more and talk about the database module um, and other things that you might see in there. So common things you might see in there is is methods to go ahead and get data from the database um, we'd also see some crud methods in here as well which we'll talk about in a minute of how to write those um, but let's look at some of these example methods to just get data out um, so good place to start is well let's say well, I want to get all of the products out of the the products collection um, so in order to in order to implement that, that does need to be asynchronous because I'm going to use the await keyword. Um, I could also have used just the provinces and the then here, and that way I wouldn't have needed the await keyword. Um, but to try and kind of encourage you and, and get some more practice with the await keyword, that's how I'm going to write it. Um, so we're going to open up that connection to the database. That's all we do. We say const database is equal to await, wait, wait until the connection is good. Um, so once you know that first time, that will be slow. Uh, that will take some time. From there on out, every connection basically it's already open, so that will be quick. Uh, all times after the first. Um, from there, from there, we're going to say let's take that database that we just connection that we just opened. We'll ask for the products collection, and then I want to say I want to find all of the records. Um, so the parameter to that find is kind of the query says what 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 records do you want to return and which records do you not want to return. Um, if I just use a spare of curly braces like that, I'm saying I want everything. Um, so there's no conditions on what do we return. So that says get everything. And then that returns actually something called, find returns something called a cursor, uh, not an array, um, or, and not a promise for an array. So we have to do some stuff with it. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about cursors in, in the next few slides. Um, but uh, what I'm going to call on there right now, just to keep the simplest call, to array. Um, so to array is going to take that cursor and turn it into a JavaScript array, load all the data, put it in a JavaScript array, so that we can use um, so we can use it as if it was a regular array um, in in our other code. Now that's not efficient calling to array here. We'll we'll talk about what you some of the things that you might do um, to correct for that, um, but but that's a that's a start. Um, so the next thing we have is is get product by ID, um, and get product by ID. I want to say we get a single product um, based on the ID that's been provided. So the ID is a parameter here. Um, so rather than calling find, which finds all of the results that match the criteria, I'm going to say find one because I know I only want just one result to come out of this. Um, so find, I'm going to say the, the condition that I want is that the ID has to be equal to the ID that was passed in. Now, the ID that's passed in is typically going to be a string, so we need to take that, that ID that's passed in and actually convert it to an object ID. If you don't convert it to an object ID, you will get an error uh, from Mongo telling you that it has to be an object ID and not a string. Um, so that's part of why we needed to do the conversion here. So I say new object ID, um, pass that in. Okay, now I have an object ID parameter. I can say underscore ID has to match this. Um, so calling find one and doing that is going to end up only giving us that one result back. Next up is get products by name. So I'm say I want to get a single product by the name. I know that we've marked the name unique already. Um, so, so given that, I know that that will only return one result. So I can say just find one. 
and then I can say I want the one where the name is name. Um, remember, this is shorthand for name colon name, um, which I could have written that that way as well as name colon name, or you can just say name. And then finally, I export all of those methods as we've done previously. Um, so that's a gist of, of a basic sort of at least start to building up your database module and, and figuring out how things fit in. Um, you'll notice that a lot of those things are very similar uh, to what we've done previously with MySQL. Uh, one thing I might mention though, um, notice in the exports that I have exported that connect method. Um, that is important that we export the connect um, because we'll need that for um, doing some, some more ad hoc queries, such as doing searching. Um, so there are some cases where you're going to need to still do some of that. You know, some of that logic will maybe can't be easily um, put into just the database module itself. You may need to pull it out, and that's where Export and Connect kind of comes in to play. Um, do be forewarned, obviously, one thing you don't want to export is don't export underscore database. Um, that needs to be something that's private. So again, the only place it occurs is, is in connect. That's the only place where it's referenced directly. All the other methods are going to reference it through connect. So we're calling connect here, and we're not referencing that variable directly. Okay. Um, if you want to read more about uh, the the different methods that we've used in this example, which I would recommend you do a little bit of reading on. Um, you can find those at the links here in the API documentation for the Node.js driver. So you can look at mongoclient.connect, mongoclientdb, the db.collection method, um, the collection.find method, as well as the collection.find1 method. Um, all of those have, have pages. Um, we'll talk more about find and five one here in a minute because there's a few things that you need to know um, as far as how to write those queries um, and how to deal with the cursor from, from find. Um, so now that we've talked about you know the basic process of connecting and, and setting up some basic queries, let's talk about how to write your own queries and how to query the data that comes back. Um, so there's there's two find methods that are provided on the collection. We've actually seen both of these already in play. The first one is find, and, and find returns a cursor for a query that you can use to iterate over the results. Um, the next one is is find one, and that finds and fetches just the first document that matches the query. Um, so the first one returns a cursor. The second one just returns a promise for the object you're looking for. Um, in both of those cases, they're the query parameter, which is the first parameter um, in the find and the find one methods, specifies how to filter um, the documents in the collection. Um, so how to filter and, and say what what documents do you want to return? Um, you can kind of think that query as your your where clause. What you would normally put in your where in SQL is is what you put in this query. Um, but it has a different syntax. Fair forewarning. Um, it, it it serves the same function, but it has a different. But the way you write it is different. Um, so that query will always be a JSON object, um, and and there's some kind of nuances to. Um, things that you can put in there. Um, so first of all, if I just put an empty document in there, that's equivalent to saying I just want to get all the documents. I want to get everything. Um, so that's in in SQL we would do that without in, by not including a where clause. Um, but but here we have to always include a filter, um, even if that filter is an empty object. Um, the next thing we do is we say. Well, what if I want to just say, maybe I want to have a simple filter that is, the name is John .do. Um If I'm looking, as I'm looking at these examples, um, the things that you're seeing on the left is what it looks like as the filter object that you write. Um, and what you see on the right, what you see on the left is the, that filter object. What you see on the right is kind of how you would write that same thing in SQL. Um, so you can kind of compare those two, and and, and hopefully that will help you translate. Um, so on the on 
if I just say name is is John Doe, I'm basically saying name is name is equal to John Doe. If I say category is shoes, well, I'm saying category is equal to shoes. If I say I, underscore ID is equal to new object ID, yada yada yada, well, then basically I'm just saying ID is equal to blah. Um, so this is what it might look like in in SQL to kind of do the the same thing, um, but we have to create this object ID. Um, piece here. Um, sometimes, oftentimes, I want to combine multiple of those filter criteria together. Um, so the simplest form of that is to just make them additional properties on that filter object. So here we've got category is shoes and color is red. Um, so that's basically putting an and in there and saying both of these things have to be true. Um, now, if I want to put an or syntax in there, um, it is a little bit more that I have to do, and I want to show you know, how do you do that both with an and and an or. So if I wanted to expand that um, using what we call the and operator, and you'll see that the, all of these operators here, and, in, or, and, or, and, in, each of those start with a dollar sign. So anytime you see that in your filter, um, or in most of these objects in, um, in Mongo, you're going to see that you, that's, that's what we call an operator. Um, so if it doesn't have a dollar sign, it's a name of a field. If it does have a dollar sign, then it's an operator. Um, that's how we distinguish between the two. So and, we're going to say and puts a bunch of um, different, um, different clauses together and says all of these have to be true. Um, so that and needs to take actually a list or an array, um, which is what you're seeing here. It needs to take an array. So the array starts at the beginning with the square bracket ends there. Um, so that can be one, that can be what you put in the and could be two or more. It could be, there could be 10 different um, criteria here that it all needs to match. Um, that's, that's okay. Um, for this simple example, I'm just putting in two objects. Um, you can kind of think about the, the curly braces in here and the additional set of curly braces kind of as parentheses. So you're saying where category is equal to shoes and color is equal to red, but, but kind of in parentheses. Um, so we're going to say, you know, have that one object. This is our first filter and then this is our second filter. Um, so you're kind of putting them together. Um, so if we want to change that to an or, it then becomes a very similar syntax um, which is which is this. So we say we want to use the or operator and then it can take a an array of different uh, sets of criteria. So it can either be that the category is shoes or it can be that the color is red. Um, other things I might commonly do once I start getting into that or I might find that well I'm saying a bunch of these you know the same property can have different values. Um, so this, this here is okay. We have category of shoes and color is red, but if I want to have, um, the color is red or the color is blue, um, there's actually a better syntax to use both because it's easier to read and because it runs faster. Um, so in that case, the, this, this is the way I might oftentimes write an or I would say where the color is in red or blue. Um, so in SQL, we would write that as color in red, blue, and that sort of, there's a special in operator in SQL. It's kind of the same thing here. Um, so if the color is red or the color is blue, then this would, this um, result would be returned. Um, other operators that you'll run into um, as we're kind of working through these operators um, would be potentially the comparison operators. Uh, now you saw with the previous examples, by default, we do equality. Um, so if I say price colon five, I'm saying that price is equal to five, uh, but I can also use like the equals operator there. Um, most of the time we don't use the EQ, EQ explicitly, but, but sometimes you may need to. Um, so EQ, EQ five, that would say price is exactly five. I could say price is not equal to five, price is greater than five, price is less than five, uh, price is greater than or equal to five, or price is less than or equal to five, which would be that LTE. Um, so there's a bunch of different comparison operators that you can do with numbers. Um, 
those do also work with strings as well. Um, so you, you can use them with that. Um, and then it would just be sorted alphabetically. Um, you'll notice as I'm putting those operators in that it kind of creates another layer. So I at the first layer, I'm, I'm specifying the name of the field. And then I'm saying the field has to satisfy this criteria. So the price has to be not equal than five. So you're going to add a, those additional um, curly braces that you're seeing there are mandatory. Um, uh, those are not those are not optional, and that's to create the the next level, the the object that you're basically doing the the comparison with. Um, there's another two operators that you can use, um, in and not in. Um, in says that this this value must be one of the one of the listed values, and not in says that it needs to be not one of the listed values. Um, so here we're saying that the price has to be five, seven, or thirteen, or it has to be not not in this list. So it can't be five, can't be seven, and it can't be thirteen. <laughs> So you can do both of those. You can do in or not in. Um, logical operators, we started looking at some of these already. Um, there's three logical operators. There's an and, there's an or, and there's a not. Um, the and lets you take a series of, of criteria here in a list and say each of the, all of these things have to be true or says at least one of these criteria has to be true. And then not says, take whatever logic I have here, whatever sub filter that I have, sub query that I have here, and say that is not true. That has to be false. Um, so you can easily invert a query using that, that not operator. Um, so for an example um, where, that, where you might see that, Let's say I want to say um, the the name issue and the color is red. I might write that as this. Um, remember, as I kind of previously mentioned, um, this can actually take it takes an array, so it can actually be more than just two things in here. And honestly, these objects in here can be much more complicated. So it could be name issue and the color is green, and this might be uh, name is name is buckle and uh, the color is um, green. You know, I could combine these and be these things have multiple criteria in themselves. Um, similarly, with the or, each of these can be, you know, sub subqueries in and of themselves. Um, not would then be like this. So here I'm saying um, the name is shoe and the color is red, but take that whole thing and not. So the name is not shoe or the color is not red would be the things that that fit this. Um, there's also some operators, two operators that we can use on elements. Um, one of those is exists and the other is type. And exists says, does that, is that property defined um, for that object, for that document? Is that field defined in, in the database? Because um, remember all fields in MySQL are optional. So sometimes you may need to know, is there one there? Um, oftentimes you can get away with with comparing the value, um, but sometimes you just want to know that a value exists, um, that there has one. So in that case, you're going to say exists true. That says that it does have a color. Um, similarly, you could say exists false, and that says that there is no color defined um, for that document, whether it be a product or whatever else it may be. Um, other thing, and, and then with the type operator, you can say what type should that value have? So here I'm saying that the type of color must be a string. So that would fail if the color is say a number. You know, if the num if the color is three, then that's not a string. Uh, now, fair for warning, there's there's a little bit of nuance to how the types work in uh, Mongo, um, specifically in the fact that there's not just one number type like there is in JavaScript. Um, the, the, jo the, the number types in Mongo are closer to what they are in, 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 uh, 
in C sharp and, and other type safe languages where you might have a, there's an int 32, I believe, um, an int 64, there's doubles and there's, um, there's floats and there's doubles. Um, so you do have to keep, keep that in mind. Um, comparing that the type is number is not as straightforward as it is um, with other things. Now there is a newer operator that you can use um, to do that check, to check if it's a number. Um, but I think that's really, it's beyond the scope of what we're going to cover here. So sometimes you may need to check that type and, and mostly you need to check that type to know if it's an array or if it's an object or string. Um, just be forewarned, if you are trying to check that it's a number, it's a little bit more, a little bit more complicated um, than just saying the number is type, you know, the field is type number. Uh, next up are the array operators. So remember with with Mongo, all of our documents can have sub um, sub documents and they can have rays inside of them. They're not limited to just being scalar values. Um, so with that, I can do things like I can have a, a, a blog or a product that has a, a set of tags that's an array. Um, if I want to compare that tags array, um, kind of the, the, the naive, naive way that most people start doing this will say, well, I'll just say, well, it's, you know, tags is this, tags is school books. I'll just give it an array. Well, as it turns out, that checks that the, the tags array is exactly what you've given it. Um, and what I mean by that is it, it needs to fit a few things. It needs to be a length of two because we've set we have an array of two. Um, the first element needs to be school. The second element needs to be book. So it it's it's not a lot if you specify it this way. Um, book and school, right? If they're out of order, if the tags on the document was book school, it wouldn't pass. It wouldn't get returned um, as a result. Um, so it it's order sensitive this way, but it's also length sensitive. So it might be that the um, that the product has 10 tags, um, two, you know, one of them is school and one of them is book, but because it has those additional tags, um, it wouldn't pass the test. Um, so, so while this is one option is the simplest one to write, it's usually not the one you want if you're comparing things with arrays. Um, so other options you have, one is the all operator, and the all operator says that everything in there, um, everything in the array you provide must be in the document that you're looking at. Um, so this one, if I write it this way, I'm saying that the, the tags must contain school and it must contain, it must include book. So it must include each, all of the tags that here. It can have additional tags, um, beyond that and they can be in any order so this would accept anything you know any ordering of a book or school um, but it has to be something that has both of those tags um, another variant that you might try is say in so the in operator says that it needs to have at least one of those so all says it needs to have every single one of those 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 elements that you provided in says, well, it only needs to have at least one. So, so here we're saying that it, will, it must have either school or book. If it has one of those two, then it passes, but it doesn't have to have both. Um, so both of those can be helpful in different queries, kind of depending on what your goal is, um, what your intent is. Sometimes you may want to match all of the things, all elements provided, and sometimes you need to only match one. Um, so the next up, you can also check the size. So I might say, you know, let's check that the size of the tags array is five. Um, so that will give me one specifically where the length of that array is five. If it's four, it's three, it's, it's six, none of those are included, it has to be exactly five. Um, so that's maybe not what I want though most of the time. Usually I want some sort of range. So I might say where the, the tags, uh, there's five or less tags. Um, and the way I do that is I combine, combine the size operator with the less than or equal to operator that you saw on a previous, sign, uh, previous slide. 
So here I'm saying um, that the size must be less than or equal to five. And I would write that as you can see on the right in SQL, I, I would nest it this level with um, Mongo. Um, so one of the things you should start noticing there, there can become quite a few levels. So it's kind of normal. Um, but I think as you kind of get used to the leveling and the way that um, uh, Mongo kind of structures these query clauses, I think things will make more sense. Um, honestly, I think they make a lot more sense um, than the way that um, they're written in MySQL, but they do take a little bit of getting used to. Um, so that's where I would say that the size is, is less than or equal to five. If I want to say it's greater than or equal to five, I would just change that to GDE. Um, I can also reference individual elements within that array. So remember the arrays are zero indexes. So the first index is going to start at zero, one, two, three, four, etc. So if I want to say, well, the first tag needs to be school, I would specify it this way. I say tags.0 colon school. So that's going to say the first tag has to be this. Um, I could also reference, say, the second tag, and I say tags.1. Um, that can be very helpful to check as, as a quick tag zero um, or the you know dot zero can be a very quick way to check um, that an array has at least one element, um, especially when combined with that exists operator um, or the, the type of operator as well. Um, so that's, that's great. Um, do notice in that syntax that we don't use square brackets when we're referring to elements within an array. It's always like dot and then the number, the, the index number. So dot one, dot two, dot three, not brackets, zero brackets, one, etc. So indexes are basically treated like properties. Um, so now we've talked about some of the filters that you can use, and, and those will apply um, for any find operation that we do, but they'll also apply for several of the CRUD operations that we do as well, um, because they say, use the same exact syntax for picking what data you want to update or, or delete. Um, so, so keep that in mind. Um, those are those are very important to, to learn their syntax. So I'm going to talk a little bit about cursors here. Um, I'm not going to go too deep on them because I'm going to reserve most of that um, most of that discussion for a later lecture. Um, but I want to get a little bit of intro to what a cursor is and, and some of the methods that are available. So find always returns a cursor object. That's how you get a cursor. You get it from a find. Um, this cursor can be used to efficiently stream large amounts of data from the database to your application. And what I mean by stream is process the data as it comes through. Um, the problem with calling to array, um, as we saw with the previous example that I mentioned, um, is that you have to load up all of the data at once. Um, so we need to kind of look at, you know, what are some of those methods that we can use on the cursor to trim down the kind of data that we, we are getting as well as how to process it a little bit more efficiently. So the first method, we, and we kind of mentioned this already, to array that will return um, an array of documents. that will return all of the results from the cursor and, and turn them into an array. Um, it's worth knowing, and this comes directly from the documentation itself, that the caller is responsible for making sure that there is enough memory to store the results. Um, MongoDB, is, it's not its responsibility to make sure that you have enough memory to store all the documents that you've asked for. Um, so if you've asked for a million documents, yeah, you're very likely going to run out of memory when you call to array. Um, that's on you. Um, it was on you to reduce the amount of, of data that was coming back. Um, so if you're returning, you know, a thousand documents or less, two array might be might be perfectly fine, um, as long as they're relatively small documents, um, your kind of average size documents. Um, but you're going to find that two array is is really 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 slow and imposes a, a major bottleneck um, and and at some point will crash um, if you're using it with um, a query that can return a lot of results. Two array is kind of a seemingly easy way to convert your cursor into an array of documents so you can work with it as, 
as a usual JavaScript array, but it's as it turns out, is the least efficient way of, of doing that, of working with it. So oftentimes you want to keep it as a cursor as long as you can and kind of deal with the, the records as they come in rather than trying to have all the records at once. Um, so one way to do that is to use, uh, one way you can work with that is you can call transform stream. Um, that will give you a what we call a readable stream of documents. Um, streams are, are part of the Node.js framework itself, part of the Node.js platform. Um, and they're used to process and process data as it comes in rather than waiting for all the data to arrive. Um, it's really beyond the scope of, of what we want to talk about here. Um, but it's worth noting that um, some of the more efficient ways to deal with uh, deal with the data as it comes in revolves around um, understanding how to work with streams in Node. Um, we haven't really talked about streams yet, um, and part of that is we basically haven't had a source for streams yet. Um, but you can start playing around with this and uh, as we start talking about how to do searching and, and displaying search results efficiently. The next method that's available is for each. Um, and it's worth noting that this for each, while it has basically the same signature as for each on a, a JavaScript array, and it works basically the same way, um, it is not actually the for each on an array because the cursor is not an array. Um, so you can use this for each to supply a function, a callback to say, call this function for every element that we get um, using a sort of iterator pattern. Um, that, that can be one way to deal with streaming the data, uh, but it's not by, it's by far not the only way to do it. Uh, another tool that you can use to limit the amount of data that comes back, and, and these three are, are more about limiting the data or, or chain, you know, processing the data that comes back from the cursor, the search, the results. Um, project is kind of similar to your select clause. Remember your select clause says, which columns do I want to return as my results and, and which ones do I want to not, not bring in? Um, so we, we can use it to determine it that way. Um, and the basic syntax for that is to say, hey, if I want the name, you know, the, the value that I pass in is an object. So I would say name colon one. And that will mean I do want the name. If I wanted to say I wanted a category as well, I, then I'd say category one. Um, so I just specify which the fields that I want return. I say the field name colon one. One says I want to keep it. Um, you know, anything I don't specify uh, will not be returned. Um, if I just if I don't call project or I just call project with an empty object, you'll get end up getting everything. It's worth noting that you can also have the option of saying I don't want to return a particular field. Um, so to say you don't want a particular field is to return negative one. Uh, one of the interesting ones in there is the ID itself. The ID is normally pretty much always returned by default. Um, so if you want to say I don't want the ID, then you have to specifically say negative um, underscore ID negative one to, to not include the ID. We'd also sort the keys. Um, in, in order to sort, we need to specify, sort the documents. We need to specify two things, um, the name of the column that we want to sort and the direction of that sort. Um, so let's say I want to sort the um, name in ascending order. I would specify name as the key, um, as a string, and then the direction would be one for ascending. If I want to say sort it by the price in descending order from the, the highest price item down to the lowest, I would say price as the first argument to sort and then negative one for descending. So one for ascending, negative one for descending. Um, that's basically the equivalent of your order by clause is sort. Um, next up we have the limit claw, the limit method limits basically like like limit is in, in a SQL query. So if I say limit five, I'm saying I only want the first uh, five results back, um, just like you're doing with limit. Um, and then if I want to do paging, I also have the, the skip method, which will give me the, the other portion of that. Um, 
So skip says how many records, the number of records you want to skip in the result set. And so if I wanted to say page to the third page of results, I would say, and I've got 10 results per page, I would say skip 20, skip the first 20 results, and then limit it to 10. So that would give me the third page of results. Um, similarly, if I want to get the fourth page, it would be skip 30, 10, skip 40, 10, etc. Um, there's also a count method that you can use to uh, find out how many res how many results are in the result set. Um, and this is very similar to the, the count star aggregate function in SQL. Um, it returns a promise for the number of rows in the result set. Um, so that will let me find out how many how many rows there are. Um, you can read more about each of these methods in the API documentation. Um, at the links below. So let's talk about manipulating data. We talked about how to read data, and that's the you know the R in CRUD. But let's talk about the the C, the U, and the D, the the creating data, the updating data, and the deleting data. Um, so inserting data, there's actually two methods for inserting data in. Uh, Mongo, you can either call insert one or insert many. Uh, insert one is it takes a single object, a single document, and inserts that into the collection. Insert many, you can use to insert multiple documents at the same time, uh, but it takes an array. Um, so this one takes an object and then options, option, which are optional. Um, this one takes a, an array of objects and then an option objects. Again, options in all of these are optional. So let's say I want to insert a single document. Um, that's not too hard to write. I just say, let's, let's create a method called insert product. It takes a product. We go open our connection to the database, um, say collection products. We're going to insert into the product selection. And we say insert one, pass that in. Cool, all done. Um, that's, that's all you need to do as far as inserting a product into the database. Um, if I want to insert multiple products at, at once, I just need to take an array instead of an object and, and call insert many. Um, updating documents, similarly, there's, there's two different update methods. Uh, one that's meant for updating a single document, and then a second one which is intended for updating multiple documents. We call this update one and update many. Um, they both take three parameters, the filter, an update object, and then optional object, optional options. Um, the filter um, is actually a query just like you would pass to find or find one. Um, it's that same sort of query syntax. Um, the update is a specialized object, um, which we'll talk about here in a minute with a few operators of its own. So let's say we want to update a single document. And in this case, I'm going to update a single product. Um, so here I'm going to call, I'm going to say, let's connect, again, connect to the database, get the product selection, and then we want to update one record in the products collection. My first op, my first argument to update one is this filter, uh, which we've kind of seen these filters before. So here I'm saying I underscore ID is equal to the products ID. So that's how I'm filtering and saying I want to update the the product with this ID. The second argument is to tell it how to update it. Um, so here I'm using the set operator, which just says set the the fields that I specify to these new values. So here I'm saying, let's set the name to the, the, pro, the new product name, um, and let's set the price to the new product price. Um, so both of these product name and product price, those are coming in as part of that, that product object that I've, that I've passed in. Okay, um, so that's how I would go about maybe updating a project product. Um, it's worth noting, in addition to the, the set operator, there's actually a few different operator, a few more operators that are available. Um, so one of those operators is the current date operator. Um, you can use that to set a particular value to the current date and time. Um, so that's, that's great. Um, you can use the increment operator um, 
to increment the value of a field by a particular amount. Um, you can pass, if you pass, give that a, a positive value, then like five or one, it will increment by that value. If you give it a negative value, obviously it will um, decrement by that amount. Um, so you can actually use that for increment and decrement. You just pass a positive or negative value. Um, so that makes things like that fairly simple to do an increment. Um, we've also got mult, uh, M-U-L, uh, which will multiply um, the the value of a by a specific amount. So maybe you want to double it, you say mol two. Uh, maybe you want to half it, you say mol it by 0.5. Um, we've also got min and max. So min takes either the 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 lowest of either the current value or the value you've specified. Max takes the the largest of either the current value or the value you specified. So you can, you can say we'll only change it if it's lower than the current value, and only change it if it's if it's bigger than the current value, for instance. Um, so those can be helpful in some cases. Um, there's also an unset operator which will allow you to remove a specific field from a document. Say, for instance, maybe you need to remove somebody's uh, phone number. Um, or address. Um, that's how you would you would remove it um, using the unset. Um, we'd also rename fields, and this happens mostly when uh, you have changes to the schema. You might need to rename it. Um, so rename allows you to to change it from one one name the field from one name to a new name. Um, and then finally, we've got an operator called set on insert. Set on insert is kind of an interesting one. Um, it's only used for upserts, um, so it says set it. What if this is if this is an insert, then and not an update, then go do this. Go change it to this value. Um, we'll talk about upserts in a minute, um, but that that operator specifically is is helpful when you're doing doing upserts. Um, not relevant otherwise. So let's say we want to update multiple documents and using some of those operators. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is say filter and, and look for, you know, what records do I want to update? So I'm going to say update many. So I'm going to update multiple documents. Um, my goal here is to do sort of a price cut. I'm going to put products on sale. Specifically, I'm going to put all the products on sale that are um, greater than five bucks. So my filter here, I'm saying, first of all, let's say is on sale is false. So if the item is not on sale, uh, then we're going to put it on sale. Um, and then if the price is greater than five, and you can see these nested comparison operators. So if it's, if it is not on sale and, and it, the price is greater than five, then we're going to reduce the price. So then I've got, so that's my filter object. Next I have my update object. So in my update object, I say, let's set um, is on sale to true. So we're going to mark that it is now on sale and we're going to multiply the price by 0 0.7. Um, so effectively that gives it a 30 per, all the item, all those items, a 30% discount. Uh, I'm using that Boolean there to kind of prevent if we we're going to do the price cut again, it won't put those items on sale again because otherwise it would keep putting them at 30% at 30% discount. Cool. Um, I think that part of the slide is missing underneath my webcam. Um, so the part that you can't see here is that price colon 7.7 7, um, and then the two pairs of curly braces. Um, so let's talk about an upsert. Um, and, and so this upsert often comes in when you don't know ahead of time whether or not a document exists. Um, you like, hey, here's the update I want to do, but I don't know if this document is here or not. So sometimes it may be an insert and sometimes it may be an update. Um, so this this upsert is very helpful because you can you can have it conditionally perform either an update or an insert operation, depending on whether or not that record exists. Um, so this is really great for things like casting votes, um, where you need to increment and decrement counters, um, or 
you don't know if their vote is already in the system. It's good for um, submitting reviews where maybe you just want to say they only get a chance to do one review and we'll just take the latest one that they gave. Um, it's good for adding products to a shopping cart. It's probably the one most common places that we use this um, because you want to say, well, if the product is not in the shopping cart, we need to add it to the shopping cart. Um, but if it's already in the shopping cart, then I just want to bump the quantity um, to increase the quantity. Um, so this can make things a lot simpler um, where otherwise you might have to write um, two trips to the database and, and three different queries. Um, you can do, rather than doing that as three separate queries, you can do it as one. Um, so this is, this is really, really helpful um, when you have these situations. So a, a very simple way to turn that functionality on is you just need, the, the basic way we turn on an upsert is we pass that third parameter um, as, up, that third parameter is our options, we say upsert is true. This now becomes an upsert and not just an update. Um, so what it'll do is it'll say, first of all, let's find the product by ID. If that product does exist, then it's an update. If that product, if there's no product with that ID, then this will actually insert a new product um, with that ID and with the, the name and price here that have been provided. So a more complicated example and more real world of where you might see that is maybe adding things to cart because I mentioned that that's a really practical place to see this. So, so here I'm going to implement add to cart with an upsert. Um, so I'm writing this method add to cart. It takes three parameters. Um, first is the user ID. Um, the second is the product object. Um, and the third one is the quantity that we want to add. Um, so do notice that I'm expecting that product is not just the ID, but the entire object, because I'm going to put in some additional values in there. Um, so the quantity, I'm defaulting it to one. That's what the equals one is. So if you don't provide a quantity, it'll assume that you're adding one to, um, you're adding one to the cart, one item to the cart. Um, so that can make things easy if you, you know, to implement if, for instance, you don't have a, you don't have a field where the user is typing in a quantity. You might just say, well, we'll just add one. Um, so in here, I'm going to say database.collection. We're going to update the carts collection. Say update one record in the carts collection. This upsert can also be implemented with an update many, um, but this is definitely a case where we're only going to update one record. My filter then is on the user ID and the product ID. So I want to find a cart object that matches both of those two things. It belongs to the user and it's also this product. Okay, so I'm going to go find it that way. And then I'm going to have my update in here. Um, you'll notice that I've passed as the third parameter. I've set upsert true. Remember, that's the part I need to make this an upsert. Um, inside of the, the update object, I'm actually using two different operators. So first I'm using set on insert. So here's the values that I want to set initially if the if the record's not there, if the document's not there. Um, and then increment says take whatever the current value is and increment it. So we're going to increment the quantity by whatever quantity they passed in. So that's the, the name of the, the quantity field. Um, and then this is the value that we want to change it by. Um, it just so happens that those are the same thing, the same name here, but oftentimes, but sometimes they won't, oftentimes they won't be. So increment it and we're going to increment it by that amount. Um, and initially when we, if this record isn't here, then we need to say what values do you want to set to initially to insert the record. So when we insert the record, we need to set a few things. Uh, well, we obviously need to set the user ID and the product ID so that we can find it later. Um, so the next time we try to add it to the cart, we don't add it again. Um, so I, I need to know those things as well as to know, you know, whose cart are we adding it to and what product did they add. So I'm setting both of those things, the user ID and the product ID. I'm also setting the product name and the product price at this point. 
um, because I do want to store those for qu quicker reference later. You know, what what is the name of the product and how much does it cost? Um, so that way I can look it up quicker at a later point in time. And I also have that historical data, you know, what what was that value when they inserted it to the cart? Um, I don't need to, I'm putting that only in set on insert and not in set uh, because I don't need to change, once it's in the cart, I don't need to change those values. All I need to do is upgrade the quantity. So that's the reason why it's set up that way. Um, so we talked about how to update, we talked about how to insert, we talked briefly now about an upsert, uh, which is a combination of the two. Um, let's talk about deleting. So there's two delete methods similar to what we've seen. There's a delete one and a delete many. Delete one is, is simply meant for deleting a single record. Um, and delete many is meant to delete multiple records if that's your that's your intent. Um, they both take two parameters. One is the filter, and that's similar to what we saw with the find and the update. It says what kind of records are you looking for? What kind of records do you want to delete? And then the options are additional arguments you might pass. Um, so let's say I want to delete a single argument, a single product, and I already know its ID. Um, all I need to pass is that filter. And, and just like we've seen with previously, if I want to filter by the ID, I say underscore ID is new object ID. Um, so taking the string that was passed in, turning an object ID, compare it. Okay, I'll delete the project product with that ID. Um, if I want to delete multiple products, um, let's say maybe I want to delete all the products where the, the, there's no more stock, where they're out of stock, so maybe the quantity of the product is zero. Uh, I would say delete many, and then here we say we'll delete all the ones where quantity is zero. So um, that might be one way to, one example for deleting multiple products. Is this probably something you want to do in the industry? Do most of the time? Eee. Deleting many is, is one, you know, deleting multiple records at once is, is not something that comes up too often. Um, but, you know, sometimes it does. So that's how you would write that is, is it's, a, it's a filter of whatever you're going to specify. Um, in addition to those basic methods, um, there's also an additional, um, there's also some additional methods, some additional versions of ways to update the um, database. And, and this is out of the fact that um, things don't have to be scalar values anymore and that it's kind of schemaless. Um, so there's a replace one method. Um, there's no no replace many version, um, but there's just but a replace one that takes a filter, a document, and an options. And it's sort of like an insert. Um, the difference being that um, if it's if if the record doesn't exist there, it's it's exactly it's basically the exactly the same as an insert. Um, however. If the record is already there, it changes and, and basically removes that record completely and adds the new one, uh, which may mean that you lose, uh, generally means that you lose all the additional um, fields that you haven't given a value to. Uh, so this can be a good way to reset things like um, somebody's address. If you're supporting multiple different address formats, say a U.S. address form and a, a British address form and a, a Indian address form, um, those have different fields and pieces of data that you might need to put in. Um, so doing a replace there might be might be favorable um, because you want to say I do want to lose those additional values and set it to just this. Um, but do be forewarned, uh, replace is a good way to lose data as well. So so use it with a grain of salt. It's good for when you want to lose that data. Uh, but it's not a great thing if you if you don't if you're not going in with that intention of losing anything I don't set. Um, so what this might look like is maybe I'm trying to replace the product and, and I'm given this product and say let's say, okay, let's go find the product with the same name and replace it with all the values that I have here. Um, oftentimes, if I'm using replace, I'm going to set that as upsert as true because I want that to um, be able to do either an update or an insert. Um, Uh, last method in here as far as manipulating data goes, um, there's also a bulk write 
op method that bulk write takes an array of operations. Um, what this will let you do is do a bunch of different write operations in one trip to the database. So say you need to do inserts and updates and deletes or upserts and replaces all at once. Uh, you can submit those as an array. So each operation is is one of those one of those calls, one of those objects. Um, you can look at the documentation for how you might use that. Um, it can be a very efficient when you need it is a very, very um, good way to improve your application performance. Um, if you do have a bunch of operations you need to do at once, um, I don't know that there's too much for this particular course where you'll need to use that. Uh, but should you run into a case where you need to do a whole slew of operations at once, definitely go look that up. Uh, so next up, let's talk about how you might validate object IDs. Um, this is something that comes up um, pretty often if, with Joy, is we're taking in data from AR from our um, from our REST API. Uh, there may be parts of that that are actually object IDs um, built into Joy. There's not really a good way to deal with that. You got to remember um, simply because you kind of got to remember that you know object IDs are not numbers. Um, and these object IDs are really kind of particular to Mongo. Um, so they you can treat them potentially as strings, um, but you cannot treat them as numbers. Um, so to validate these object IDs, we're going to install and use a, a package called joy-object ID, um, which provides a specialized validator for these. Now, the process for setting it up and using it um, is kind of a three-step process. Uh, the first thing we need to do is install the dependencies. Um, so we need to install Joy if we haven't yet. Um, and then we also need to install Joy object ID. So bring in both of those dependencies. And then we need to extend the Joy class. Now, when you extend that Joy class, you, you only need to do it once. Um, so we generally do that as early as we can in the server setup, which means doing that in server.js. Um, these lines of code you need to put there, you don't need to put them anywhere else. Um, so this is what defines the joy.objectid method, which we'll do use later. Um, if you find out later in the process that that joy.objectid method doesn't exist, um, it, it can, you get an error that complains that there is no such method, um, that's what you're missing, um, is you're missing these, these two lines of code. So the first thing we need to do is um, require the joy module itself. Um, and then I'm going to save that to, to a variable named joy. Um, next up, I'm going to require the joy-object ID module. That basically returns a function. Um, so that function then needs to take, it's what we call, refer to a factory function. It creates another function. Um, so we need to, you know, require drive object ID, call that function, call that factory function, passing in joy. Um, so it'll then be connected to that particular instance of the joy module. Um, and then we save that result to joy.objectID. Um, so all of this ends up basically adding the object ID method to the to joy, um, which is what we need for for validating things later. So then going back to our REST APIs or other places where you might be, you know, using joy, um, you're going to specify in your schema where you might say joy.string, joy.number. Um, you're going to specify, well, the type is joy.objectid. So here I would say, well, let's say I need to take a, a user ID and a product ID. I might say joy.objectid.required, and product ID is joy.objectid required as well. So that's how you do the, the validation using that object ID module. Finally, let's talk a little bit about indexes. Um, remember, indexes are really important for performance in MongoDB as they, as they are in every database. 
um, but especially as you're working with NoSQL, indexes are really, really important. Um, indexes support the efficient execution of queries in MongoDB. Um, without indexes, MongoDB would have to perform a collection scan, i.e. means, um, for example, scan every document in a collection um, to select those documents that match the query statement. Um, so that's a really big deal. If you have a if you have a collection with a million documents, and you want to say I just want the one where the name is Red Boots, well, it has to look at all those million documents without if you don't have an index on the name. But if you have an index on the name, then it can skip down and, and only look at a handful of documents instead of looking at all of them. Um, so as long as there is an appropriate index for the query that you're running, and, and that means you have to usually create more than one index. Um, you have to create an index that specifically fits to um, what the query, what the columns, the, the fields that you're looking for. Um, MongoDB can use that index to limit the number of documents that it has to inspect. Um, so indexes are a very special data structure um, that stores a small amount, a small portion of the collection's data set um, in an easy to traverse format. It means it's easy to go um, travel over it, um, to investigate it, to search it. Um, the, the index stores a small stores the value of a specific field or, or set of fields because um, you can, can index more than one field at a time ordered by the value of the field. So the ordering of the index um, also supports, uh, sorry, the in ordering of the index supports efficient equality matches as well as range-based query operations. So that includes, you know, saying it's exactly this or it's less than or equal to or greater than. It supports all of those things. Um, but it also can be used to return the results in a, a sorted order by using the ordering of that index. Um, so, for instance, if you want to say you want to order it by name, uh, sorting sorting it by name, or sorry, you want to you want to sort it by name. Um, having an index on the name also helps there. Um, or if you want to sort it by price, then then having an index on the price helps as well. Um, so, in a simple example here, pulled from their documentation, you can kind of look at the the diagram here. It illustrates um, that select um, using a query that, that selects and orders the matching results um, using an index. So we're saying db.users.find. Um, so we're finding users um, with a score that is less than 30. Um, so if the score is less than 30, it's going to get returned. Um, normally, I would have to go look at all of the documents down here in the collection. Um, and go through every single one of those. Um, but you'll know, one of the things you'll notice is they're not ordered by um, underneath here. They don't really have a predictable order and they're definitely not ordered by the score, um, which is part of why I have to go through all of them is because I don't know if I've just gone through these first three records if I've followed all of them. And as it turns out, the, the last one that matches is all the way maybe at the end. Um, so, so I may have to go through all of those. Um, so going through an index instead, which here an index has been created on the score, um, this then becomes much more efficient because I can, rather than going down to all here, I can go just through these, basically an index, which is a collection of shortcuts to all the documents or pointers, um, pointers, references, similar kind of things. Um, so I can start from you know the minimum value in the index and go up to 30 and just look at that. I don't need to look at any of the I don't need to look at any of the documents that live over here. Um, so that that means I have less to look at, which is great. So here it ends up only being these these three: score 25, score 5, and score 18. Um, so that's much quicker than looking at the entire users collection. Um, and then next thing I want to do is I'm going to sort the scores. I'm going to sort them in descending order, which is the negative one. So I'm going to sort them from the, the highest down to the lowest. If I wanted to do an ascending order, I basically just follow 
this uh, index from the left to right, but because I want to do it in descending order, I'm going to follow the index from the right to the left. And that way, I will end up getting all of the results that are um, less than 30 and also sorted by their score. Um, so the index p plays a key role in, in both of those two aspects, both the filtering as well as the sorting. Um, so it's really, really important in terms of getting good performance. Uh, now, you can create an index in Mongo in a few different ways. Um, we talked about how to create an index in Compass last week, and just to refresh on that, um, the way to do that is, is to navigate to the collection um, that you want to add an index to, uh, click the Create Index button, um, enter the index name, add where fields to that index that you want to index. So let's say the name and, and is it ascending or descending? And then there's there's a few optional checkboxes beneath that you can check or uncheck to t determine how um, you want that to be, how, how you want that to behave. So um, if I remember right, the full op set of options for indexes are not fully supported in Compass. Um, so are some that you need to go through another route to get to. Um, so for instance, uh, one of the options that you might want to pick is say to build the index in the background instead of building the index in the foreground. Uh, by building it in the background, that means that it, it happens over time and, and users are not blocked while it's doing that. A um, user can still use the collection while it's building the index. If you tell it not to do it in background, then it's going to block them from, from touching that collection until it's done. Um, in terms of collections that are relatively small, that doesn't make much difference. And if you don't have many users, it really doesn't matter too much. Um, but let's say you have a million documents in that collection, it's going to take a long time. And if you have a bunch of users using that using that data, um, they're going to you know have a bit of a, a problem because they can't access the data during that time. Um, so you you. That's generally a good thing to check, especially in a production environment. If you're going to add an index, make sure that's built in the background. Um, there's another checkbox there for making sure it's a, for creating it as a unique index. We looked at that um, last week to make sure that you know you don't have duplicate values. Um, there's another checkbox that can be interesting. Um, it says partial filter expression. Um, if you check that, then you also have to provide another. Uh, a filter expression to say, you know, these are the things I want to index um, because that means it won't index everything. Normally it indexes every document in a collection. You can use that to specify that only some, some things should be indexes, indexed. Um, it doesn't come up too much, but, but sometimes it's helpful depending on what you're, what you're actually indexing. Um, you can also create these indexes using the shell. Um, and you use the db.collection.createIndex method for that. Um, so we might say, and, and, and that takes two things. It takes first, you know, specification of what the index is, as well as some options that are, again, optional. Um, so for instance, if I want to create a, a index on the name column for products, I would do it this way in the, in the console, in the shell. I would say db.products.createIndex name is one and oftentimes I find out find that the creating index in the shell is usually a lot quicker and a lot easier than than creating them in the um, in compass so that's usually how I end up creating my indexes is via the shell um, you can also potentially create your indexes using the node driver itself using the create index method um, this is something you have to be kind of weary of um, because it's it's usually something that you only want to happen um, very infrequently. Um, the problem with putting this into your code, um, into your actual application, is that it tends to get invoked way too way too often, and that can really slow down your application if it's constantly trying to create these indexes um, or check that they exist. Um, so so generally speaking, I'll I'll do that in the shell or in, or in Compass. Um, to set things up. Um, the way you do it though, if should you need to do it in code, you take the database um, and then say collection.products 
uh, or collection dot the, the name of the collection and you say create index and here we do the the spec for that uh, there. Um, create index does return a promise, um, so you want to await that to make sure that it has a chance to go through um, before you do the next thing, and as well as so you can check if it was successful or failed. Um, so that's the end of, of what I wanted to cover here today. Um, I know that's quite a decent amount of material. Um, we covered a few different things, um, but that will give you a baseline of, of everything that's kind of available to you working with MongoDB from uh, being able to connect to the database, um, being able to connect efficiently to the database, specifically using that singleton pattern. Um, make sure you do implement that in when you use, when you implement that connection process. Um, also talking about how to read data and a few of the different um, operators and such that are available to build those queries. Um, we talked about how to work with the cursors a little bit um, that come back from find. And then we also talk, we talked about how to um, mod manipulate the data, whether it be updating the data, um, inserting data, deleting data, doing that sort of upsert operation, which is a combination of insert and update, um, or even replace. Um, so we talked about that in terms of manipulating data. We talked about how to use joy to object ID um, to validate object IDs in your REST APIs to make sure that they're actually good um, object IDs. And then we talked about uh, how to work with how to create some indexes in a few different ways and, and why those are important. All right, so that's the end of this lecture. Um, and I'll see you again next time. And we'll talk about more about how to make our queries efficient and full text searching. Yay. All right. See you then.